thankfully we responded the way silver medalists do and we got back on our horse and really set out to race the way that we trained which i think has been the big message for me through all these olympics is uh, yeah just racing the way that you train is the most important thing what does it mean to navigate the olympic stream what can we learn from the journey the destination and beyond I'm Adam Creek, and this is Row Row Tokyo, exploring the past, present, and future of the Canadian rowing athletes on their path to Tokyo 2020. Ladies and gents, we got a hot one for you. Jacob Buzcek, Luke Gadsden, Gavin Stone, William Peter Simpson Crothers, the Canadian Four, along with the spare Josh King. Let's get into it. Gentlemen, men's four plus spare, welcome to Row Row Tokyo. Greetings. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, let's go down the boat. We'll start um, from bow seat, work our way up to stroke seat, and then we'll introduce the spare. So I want each of you to talk through who you are, where you came from, who your first rowing coach was, and talk a little bit about your path to Tokyo. So we'll start with bow seat, which I believe is Jacob. I was born in uh, Kitchener, Ontario, but then moved to Boston, Massachusetts at a pretty young age for my mom's work. So that's actually where I started rowing in high school on my high school team with my first coach, Brian DeDominici. Big shouts out to him. One of the best coaches I've had for sure to this day. What was so great about Brian? Big technical focus on the sport. We didn't really have a lot of big, strong boys, big, strong ergs on the squad. So we really focused on growing well and just doing a ton of drills instead of spending, you know, countless hours on the erg. And I think that kind of stuck with me for the rest of my rowing career, starting out like that, not ingraining too many really bad habits early on in your career that can then be hard to get rid of was pretty good for me. So that's kind of why I've always regarded him as being a really good coach. What was one of the best drills the Dominici taught you? A lot of (laughs) roll-ups. I mean, pretty basic universal drill, but... So tell us what a roll-up is for someone who's less familiar with sport. So if you're sitting at the finish of the stroke, at the very back end, legs straight, lean back or up to your chest roll up drill is just the motion of tapping the hands down and away swinging the body over floating up the recovery up the slide and then placing the blade in at the catch at the front of the stroke and doing that when the boat isn't moving especially is just very challenging to get the the set right this is all in eights. I didn't mention, but this is high school rowing was all really eights and fours for me. So it's especially if you have a bunch of novices in there, it's going to be pretty brutal drill to do for a long time, but you just keep working on it. And yeah, that was just one of many, but I, I remember that one the most just because that's how we started every single session, basically until you could do it right. Yeah, roll-ups because the boat's so long and skinny and it flops around and you're scared that you might roll roll over, get wet. Right. Building that trust out with the other guys in the in the boat. Make sure the boat doesn't tip over. So you're a high schooler rowing in Boston. Where to from there? I was always a skinny kid in high school. Still I am a skinny kid. But there I got recruited to row lightweight at Columbia University, which is when I started pursuing the U23 pathway. I was living in in the States and going to school in the States, but I still wasn't an American citizen. I was just there with a green card. So in the summers of university, I was aiming to get on the Canadian team. I mean, I was heavily invested in watching YouTube videos of all the OG stuff that Kevin Light made. And I remember watching all the Canadian boats racing and especially in 2012 when I was a senior in high school. And I was just like pretty charged up to try and be part of that environment. 
So I pursued U23 racing in the summers of university, originally as a lightweight, but then I was told pretty promptly I was too big of a lightweight at that point. They didn't trust that I would make weight because collegiate lightweight rowing is just so different from international lightweight rowing with the weigh-ins in college being the day before the race versus internationally, it's two hours before the race. So there was just no way I could have made that weight and been in, in shape to perform. And the weight for a lightweight is 70 kilograms. Is that right? Or fi- is it Internationally. Lightweight? Yeah. It's maximum 72 and a half. Yeah. I believe. And, and co- yeah, same thing in collegiate rowing. It's that's the maximum you can weigh is 160 pounds. Okay. And what would you weigh in now going to Tokyo? Now I'm around 190 pounds, 192. Okay. So like, that's yeah. 88 ish kilos, 87 definitely not a lightweight anymore no <laughs> <laughs> solid heavyweight bicep curls are in the way of him becoming lightweight now yeah. <laughs> too, too many beach weights yeah you yeah. should see this guy at the end of the way it's, it's insane <laughs> yeah now that i'm allowed to develop these muscles I'm kind of a waste of weight i'd take advantage of that <laughs> <laughs> Look good, feel good, go fast. That's a, I'm still skinny compared to all these other boys here. <laughs> that's, a, that's amazing. So you you came on the scene, Men's 8, 2018. Is that right? Yep, that was my first senior race, yeah. And what was the path from U23s, which I see was in 2015, to seniors in 2018? So a few months after U23s in 2015, I had a pretty bad skiing accident where I couldn't row for a long time. I, I like basically shattered four vertebrae in a downhill ski accident. So I spent a lot of that time between just going through rehab and trying to get back into a position where I could row and, and train full time. Between 2015 and 2018, I finished university and then i started working and training on the sides until i got to a point where i felt like i was fit enough to try and fly out here to nrc's and give it a go which ended up working out obviously it definitely did what did you study in university and where were you working i studied sustainable development which is basically like described as econ mixed with environmental science and so i was working with an, a company called eastern research group erg ironically enough <laughs> <laughs> so i got a lot of erging on my resume yeah that's <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, that's great i'll use that as a as a segue talking about erging luke you're in two seat right luke sure am Sure. Am. Okay. Tell me about your erg. Tell me about your best erg ever, or your most memorable erg. Best erg ever is is no Gavin Stone, but it's it's all right. It's five fifty eight, which isn't super super fast, but it's faster than I've been in a while. So I mean, I'm happy to be under six and be part of that club, but it's definitely nothing crazy. Uh, what are the ergs of everybody in the the boat? If I can ask. Awesome. Top secret information, yeah. Is it top secret? Se- what? No, no, no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Gavin, you go for it, bud. You're our pride and joy. <laughs> uh, my 2K is 5.45. Oh, that's good. Yeah. What'd, you go, what'd you go on the RP3 the other day? Though? What'd you go on the RP3? The yeah, we did an RP3 a couple of weeks before flying to Last Chance, and I managed to go 5.39 on it. So, Oh, wow. I was pretty happy about Crazy. that. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. And no jokes about that. Do you guys train on the RP3 a lot? We mainly use that over the ERG nowadays, I'd say. We do one session a week, like dry land training on the rowing machine, and we've started to choose the RP3 over the ERG more and more. just want to say it has a, the fan slides back and forth versus the your traditional ERG, the Concept2 rowing machine that has the seat that slides back and forth because it simulates the movement of the boat better just as the boat is traveling underneath you in the rowing stroke and we get a lot of feedback from the little monitors that we use there's a bit more data on there as far as the power curve 
of the stroke. So kind of showing your wattage throughout the stroke instead of just one kind of point of data uh, on the Concept2 machine. I have my own RP3 and I really like the stroke length data. And that's one that I constantly watch. So let's get back to Luke. So Luke, we're talking about some ergs. You have 558, Gavin Stone 545. How about you, Will? My best ever is uh, 553 on the Concept2, 2K. Yeah. And then how about you, Josh? My best is 608 on the C2 as a pretty fresh heavyweight. So I'm excited to try and go under six next time. Yeah, bulk up. And where are you weighing in now? 82 kilos-ish. The heaviest I was in the winter was 90. So okay. a little bit too much body fat. When I was 21, I weighed 85 kilos. And by the end, I was 100, uh, 101 kilos. <laughs> Jacob. My best is 558 now, the yeah. C2. Solid power. Nothing to write home about, but I'll take it. Because obviously it's never enough. Even Gab will tell you that. No, it is never enough. Let's get back to two seat. Luke, where'd you come from? Tell me about your first rowing coach, your path. I started rowing in high school in grade nine in Hamilton, Ontario. My first coach was Andrea Miller. Again, big shouts out to her. She really helped me kind of pave the path to get to this point. She, I had a bit of a different journey than Jacob. I didn't row an eight at all in high school. We didn't really have a huge program. So I was mainly in the single every once in a while a quad in high school. And then every summer I rode a pair with a really good buddy of mine. We had some really good success there. And I did some small national team stuff when I was younger. Like I did Canada Max, which was a blast, which kind of introduced me to the whole Team Canada thing. And then I did the World University Games as well and a couple under 23s. The thing that paved the path for me coming out here was Doug Chima in the 2012 eight was a Leander Boat Club member as well. And after their games, when they came back with the silver medal, he had a little meet and greet down at Leander and I got to hold and see the medal, which was pretty cool. And it was at that moment, in, I think it was like grade 10, where I was like, oh, Quiz is pretty sick. Kind of want one of these. That's kind of how it started for me. Yeah. So Doug, Doug Chima comes back, silver medal, men's eight, 2012, yeah. and yeah, plants the seed. And now here you are rolling yeah. with, with his buddy, Will. One of, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> crazy. Full circle. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on to Gavin, three seat. Obviously, you have some power. Tell me about your come into the sport. I started rowing in high school in grade nine with Island Lake Rowing Club, which is a pretty small rowing club and uh, a volunteer run. So I kind of had two first coaches, Kathy Wilson and Locke Davenport, who really helped just kind of instill the love of the sport in me. and. Uh, so I didn't do too much. Where's Island Lake Rowing Club? That's in, in Orangeville, Ontario. And didn't do any sweeping really in high school. It was a lot of time spent in the single and then occasionally rowing in the double or quad with some other people. It was super fun. And similar to Luke, I ended up going to Canamax in my grade 12 year, which was super fun and kind of as a competitive person made me see like where you can take the sport. When I started up in university, that was getting to under 23 is the next level was on my mind and what I was working towards. Okay. And where did you go in under 23s? In 2017, I rode the quad in Bulgaria, which was a pretty sweet experience. And then in 2018, I really wanted to uh, sweep that year because like, the senior program was getting an eight back and I knew that was kind of going to be my path to the senior team if I could get fast enough. So I rode in the under 23-8 in Poland that summer and then went back to Queens for the fall and had a pretty successful NRCs in the single I decided to defer my last year of school and move out to Victoria and try to take my shot at going to Tokyo full time. So I moved out to Victoria in 2019. And so you rode at Queens, Gavin. Yeah. 
Yeah, under Phil Marshall. Is that right? Yeah, he took over in, yeah, wrote at Queens. Phil Marshall took over when I was in my second year and coached me during the fall of my third year, which was definitely a huge step forward in my progression. So what was Phil like as a coach? He came to the university level and really made it high performance oriented. So put in pretty strict erg standards that cut the team down to just a few people. I was just in the single every single day and just really refining my boat feel and trying to like learn how to move efficiently and use the power that I did have the right way. <laughs> yeah. And so tell me about using your power the right way. Everyone has certain amounts of power, but it's kind of useless if you're disrupting the boat run or digging deep or taking anything away from the other guys in your boat, always working on using it as efficiently as possible. You're talking about power and moving the boat. So tell me about how you don't let power work to your disadvantage in a boat. A lot of the stuff we've been working on this past year has just been using everything we have the right way. If you get to the catch and start looking to work hard or look like you're going to like be a hero and move the boat yourself and you kind of can start lifting or grabbing at it with your upper body. And so a lot of the stuff I'm trying to think of and working up as a group is getting up to the catch and just, letting your blade fill and trusting that the work you do with your legs is putting enough power on the face of the blade and you just hold it through with the body and arms. When you say holding through with your body and arms, that's when you're pushing down your legs and making sure that you feel an element of hang. Is that right? Yeah. The magic of it is how do you maximize the power output and maximize efficiency? There is an element of physicality that has to be put into it. You have to pull hard, but we've all pulled hard in boats that have gone slow, Uh, right? (laughs) The goal is to get to a point where you can pull hard in a boat that goes fast. Speaking of people who can pull hard and go fast, let's move on to Will. Well, Carruthers, you're the veteran in the crew. You've been to the London Olympics, the Rio Olympics. I remember you're just popping onto the scene around the periphery when I was going to the Beijing Olympics. So you've you've definitely ridden the rodeo a few yeah. times. Tell me about your path, where you came from, some of your Olympic experiences. I want to talk about uh, London and Rio and what you learned from those that experiences and how you're bringing that into Tokyo with the crew. I'm from Kingston, Ontario. My first coach was Nathan Splinter, AKA Master Splinter. And he was an awesome coach. He was a coxswain for the, for Queens University. And I think just as many people before him volunteered to help him get where he went, he decided to volunteer and pick up a crew, which was my novice coxed four with Jeff Overington, John Pollock, Solomel Makulu, and Rob Vanner. Shouts out, undefeated novice season. Right away, he was an amazing coach who understood the eye of a coach because he was a coxswain, but was also part of the guys as an athlete. Right away, he instilled this great camaraderie in our boat and allowed us to have a lot of fun and go fast at the same time. Nathan was an amazing first coach to have. And then after that, I was really just a product of the development system in Rowan Canada at the time. I went through junior world champs twice and then under 23 world champs four times, 2006, seven, eight, nine. Probably highlighted by the 2006 year where I got to do under 23s and the senior team where I rode with some of your uh, teammates from 2008. I rode alongside them and tried to chase them up and down the lakes in Italy. And at the same time, got a scholarship to the University of Washington, which was awesome because I could pop up and down between Seattle and Victoria to get ready to row on the national team. 
pretty easily. Yeah, and then I moved to the training center in 2010 and tried to make my way onto the team and earn the respect of the guys that were already there and kind of make my way on the team. I just tried to you know, learn as much as I could and compete as much as I could. As you said, made my way onto the London 2012 team where we got a silver medal, which is just an amazing experience. I remember being asked on the media doc before the medal doc if I was coming back and kind of before I even thought about it, I said yes. So locked and loaded for another four years. And then Rio was another amazing experience. 2012 was an interesting go because you had come in in you know, 2011, you had won bronze at the World Championships the year yeah. before. You had coach Spracklin, and so you were still kind of carrying on with you know the Spracklin coaching method and the Spracklin tradition. And then uh, it, there was a little bit of the legacy, because I know uh, you had Malcolm Howard and Andrew Burns in your boat that were also in uh, in my boat in 2008. Don't forget so, Pricey. The little oh, guy. and Brian Price, yeah. Don't forget Brian Price. He was quite, quite an amazing coxswain, if not one of the best coxswains that ever was. Hadn't quite had the same level of success as the eight, the quadrennial prior, but still had some pretty good results. You come into to London. I remember watching this. You had the race, and you didn't perform. You sort of you, kind of like... You, you blew know, it, you can you say. You blew it, it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep my language in check here. Now, we had the second slowest time in both heats, and I remember trying to watch the race replay, and you have that shot of when all the boats crossed the line. And it was one, two, three... Germany, Great Britain, and the Netherlands, who were probably our main contest contenders. And they wouldn't even continue filming the finish line long enough for us to come through the frame to show where we finished, even though it was only a four-boat race. So we were well off the back in that race, which was my first Olympic race, which was a pretty horrible feeling because I, I went out in that race feeling what I thought was amazing. And I, I'm sure the experience was different for each one of the other guys in the boat, especially the, the veterans. They probably knew it was coming. But for myself, like I thought I felt invincible and I was just so strong and like nothing could stop me. And then as soon as the gun went off, I was sitting in the stroke seat and personally felt like I was just spinning my wheels out of the blocks. That was a, a feeling I won't soon forget coming uh, last in that heat race and the ensuing conversations and days around our hotel and the Olympic venue were just very stressful, unlike anything I've experienced for sure. So what was so stressful? Tell me about some of the conversations and what was what was going around because it's a team, nine, nine individuals, eight roars, one coxswain plus the coach. Your confidence really takes a hit in a moment like that. I was kind of rowing around the venue before with this S on my chest, feeling like Superman, to just feeling like the smallest person at the venue. I didn't know what I was doing. I can remember going up and down the course the next day, trying to do a ladder, which was one of Spracklin's infamous workouts to kind of help you step the quality up while stepping the effort up. And in the stroke seat, one of your jobs is to hit uh, certain strokes per minute. And I just... Went from being able to hit, sometimes I hit 28.7 and I could get super close for like strokes per minute is what that number is. And then I just like completely lost my ability to set a rhythm. And it was just an awful experience. Some of the talks we were having at the hotel room where we did our race debrief were just very hard conversations to have, but the necessary ones to go out and perform in the repechage. And thankfully we responded the way silver medalists do and we got back on our horse and really set out to race the way that we trained which I think has been the big message for me through all these Olympics is uh, yeah just racing the way that you train is the most important thing because when the chips are down you're going to fall back on what's second nature to you so we were able to do that and get ourselves on the dance floor in the A final and then go out and really attack a solid plan that was laid out for us by Mike and with all of our input. 
and we were able to execute that. Unfortunately, it was a little bit shy of the gold medal, defending the the Olympic champion Canadian eight way, but we had an epic race and left it all out on the course and came away with a silver. So it was an amazing experience. We struggled with inconsistency. And if you look at our track record, you probably agree. I mean, one day at Lucerne, we're setting the world record. The next day we were third. One thing that Mike said to us and I feel like Brian and maybe some of the experienced guys like Malcolm and Fernsey probably had a bit more input in this when talking to Mike, but just having the idea that, you know, we need to go out and initially race the crews that we know that we can beat. We knew that Germany and Great Britain were going to fly off the start and try to beat each other in the first 500 meters. And we decided that we were going to go out and just try to beat all of the boats we knew we could beat and that we'd beaten before. So we wanted to beat the Netherlands, USA, Australia, and the Dutch. And so in the beginning, Brian was calling off of those boats more so than the Germans and the Brits who were battling it at the front. And I think that that was like the perfect strategy for us to get ourselves into this race because... Uh, I think our boat just responded really well to, you know, positive feedback from Brian and knowing what we were doing was working. And so in that first thousand meters, we were thinking about, all right, we're going to put these guys away. And so we put the, put the nails in the coffins around the, of the boats around us and then started hunting down the Brits and were able to do that successfully. And then we kind of set our sights on the the Germans as well and started chasing them down and, so I think our approach to the race was just varied, but it was one that would allow us to get our best race out of us. And so there was never any talk of we're racing for the silver. That was never in anybody's minds. But we were certainly trying to take it stroke by stroke and step by step and knowing what we were capable of and going out and attacking that. And yeah, unfortunately, we were a second short in the end of the Germans, but we were running downhill at that point for sure. <laughs> and what have you learned about consistency over that four years? Because you said the crew was very inconsistent and you kept said it flippantly, <laughs> but you had <laughs> you set the world record in Lucerne yeah. with that crew, which was a very impressive feat. Mm-hmm. And and so you've had the ability to go really fast, but weren't able to call on it all the time. So it, it's now eight years later, nine years later. So you must have learned one or two things since then. Yeah, I think just how important it is, really, to put it plainly. And the group of guys that we have now is performance on demand is a big thing for us. And it's one thing that I can look back at all the recent two-kilometer pieces we've done as part of our team series where we've raced off against the whole squad. It's been very consistent now. And so we have this baseline that we can then improve things upon and make small tweaks instead of feeling like we have to go back to the drawing board, which I think was one of the things that happened in 2012. And it wasn't necessarily that we went back to the drawing board, but we went back to the drawing board and looked at what was already written there and (laughs) just tried to execute that. And that was one of the things that we struggled with. Rio was injuries, not allowing us to be consistent and get the necessary time in the boat with the personnel that ended up racing. So it was just a troubling thing for us in that quad and it's nice and it's very relaxing i guess to have that feeling in this group of guys there's a lot of performance on demand so i've always believed that unless you're close to injury or at least flirting with injury that you're training at the level you should be because that's when you're pushing your body to the max you're maximizing your physical capacity talk to me about the different injuries that you experience as a rower and if you feel comfortable going into it, but what sort of injuries has your crew dealt with? One of the most common rowing injuries is our rib stress fractures, which uh, is also a good indicator that you're really pushing it hard and riding that line of training too hard. So yeah, I, I found out that I had a rib stress fracture just two months before our last chance qualifier that was a few weeks ago. So that whole period of time 
where I had to be out of the boat completely for, I think it ended up being eight weeks. It was like super stressful, just especially get with the timeline that we had so clearly marked for or been working towards this one race now for for so long with it being delayed a year and and whatnot and now for everything at the last moment to kind of start falling apart it was super stressful to deal with but luckily josh and luca just step in um, and keep the project going and they actually feed into the project and let it grow to be even better than it was and so tell me how other athletes around the periphery of the boat feed into the project and help it out. And, I, and I'll just share some of my own experience because there were so many athletes who trained around R8 who you know, didn't get you know the same sort of medal or glory, but I would say they were just as instrumental in our ability to perform being in a competitive environment is is critical for training. You don't want to ever be complacent just because you're doing well. You feel like you're winning workouts or you always want to have someone next to you pushing you. And I feel like we've had such a small group for a long time now in our training environment that it, it could be easy to, especially if you think that your seat is guaranteed in the boat and then it's easy to maybe fall off the the target a bit. So you kind of always want to have a fire under your seat. And and that comes in the form of, of the training partners that are in the periphery of the boat. So it's critical for, for any boat's success. It's a lot more than just those those guys that are sitting in the boat at the starting line. So many fellows that have been through the training and center since I've been here that have pushed the boat along, pushed the boat along. And it, it absolutely is a, a summation of all those things by the time that you're racing at the end of a quadrennial. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, how about we use that as a transition to the spare, who's also on on the call, Josh, Josh King from Ottawa. So here you must have stepped in when Jacob was out with a uh, rib injury, letting it making sure that the boat could continue its training and you know tell me a little bit about what it means for you to be a spare josh and then then we'll go back to your beginnings i remember the first or second day that i hopped in the boat we did some pieces with the women's eight and just the first kind of piece in the back of my mind was just don't mess it up don't mess it up, don't mess it up. And we actually ended up having like a really good piece against the women's aid. And so from there, it was kind of just trying to add more and more to the boat to get it to go faster, making some like rhythm changes. It was kind of stepping in, just trying to buy into what Will was laying down, regardless of my own opinions, just trying to help the project of the four go and be as fast as possible. My main goal is whatever is going to make the four the fastest, not maybe what will make me the fastest. Mm -hmm. So there's there's an element of self-sacrifice that comes into the crew boat. Uh, yeah, definitely. And and you kind of you come from a background you are you more of a sculler? Is that right? Once the Lightweight men's four got cut from the Olympic program. I pretty much switched exclusively to sculling. I would say a lot of my development years were spent sweeping, and I probably enjoy sweeping more. But yeah, definitely 2016 through pretty much 2020 was spent exclusively in the single and the double. A single and the double. And so, how is the four when you hop into it? How is the rhythm in the field different from, say, what you would naturally want to do in a single or a double? Uh, it's just moving so much faster, especially sitting in bow seat. So just with the boat moving so much faster, I find you have to be a lot quicker with the catch and the connection and a lot faster with the legs, almost faster than what you would ever expect. And then kind of once you've, thought about how fast that is then trying to make it a little bit faster on top of that <laughs> so quick you know lively 
I love that. And how did you get your start? Where did you start rowing? Uh, I started rowing in grade 11 at the Ottawa Rowing Club for my high school. I went to Lisgar High School, and I was coached by Ed Fournier. He has been coaching for 20 years, I think. So he's a legend around the Ottawa Rowing Club. Yeah, yeah. Ed Fournier, Ottawa Rowing Club, big rowing club, great place. And so you moved through the ranks of the Ottawa Rowing Club. Ed was your coach. What did Ed teach you? He actually has said almost identically, it sounds like what Mike Spracklin has said, where there's rate, there's power, and there's length. And all three of those things combined is what's going to make the boat the fastest. So we did a lot of low rate, long, and powerful strokes during my development. And I think that definitely kind of helped set, set up my training mentality out here. And so you worked through the program and you came out for the lightweight program. And so you're sculling. And were you contending for the for the light men's double? Yeah. So in 2019, before COVID happened, I was the spare for the light men's double. So I was training the single. And then my original plan was to become a heavyweight after the 2020 Olympics. And then when COVID happened and everything got delayed a year. I just decided to switch a year early. So I didn't really have any expectations in terms of where I am right now. So being first year as a heavyweight and being the spare, I'm pretty pleased with the developments that I've made over the last year. Yeah, you know, encouraging. And what's the difference that you've noticed between, say, lightweight, high-level lightweight rowing and heavyweight rowing? I mean, definitely not any calorie restriction, which is pretty nice. The way that I fuel my workouts and think about eating, I think, has changed a little bit. In terms of the rowing itself, I would say it's not insanely different. There's definitely more mass, even in the smaller boats, like the single, just changing the the weight around the front. You can kind of feel the extra kilos that I have, definitely carrying that that weight that way it's not there, obviously, in lightweight rowing. But the rowing stroke itself, I would say, isn't drastically different. So where, where do you notice the weight when you start to carry extra weight? Like, how do you feel it in the boat? In the single, I would say... I would say maybe just off of the front end, it seems a little bit heavier, but nothing that's insanely drastic. And then just maybe suspending the weight through, you can kind of just put more leverage onto the end of the oar, which is where I'm able to create more power. Yeah. So I find this a little fascinating because I, I got a lot of inspiration from the lightweight squad when I was a heavyweight. I train in the winter probably around in pounds, you know, 220, 225. And then I cut down to just under 208 for racing. And I try to carry that extra weight through the winter to help avoid injury and to get through the massive volume. But then in the same way that you'd ask the coxswain to cut a pound to make the boat go faster, if you could make sure that you're carrying less fiber and less useless mass, the boat would go faster. I'd like to put it out to the entire group. And is that something that crosses your mind as a group of heavyweights, especially now that you have some converted lightweights as part of the group? Will you have that conversation to say, hey guys, let's you know cut down on your fiber three days before the race and make sure that you're not carrying any extra junk in your intestines. That's not going to help us. I think our dietitians kind of talked to each of us, maybe except for Jacob, about losing a couple kilos of weight. Just talking about how a kilo of mass can add a lot of drag to the boat. Yeah, I feel like the boys have been on a kick lately, joking about it being cutting season, kind of half jokingly, knowing that we do want to be a bit lighter when it, when we're racing. And but yeah, I've definitely been very lucky as a lightweight to not have any injuries during my rowing career, despite being a bit 
malnourished a lot of the time. And it wasn't until I got quite a bit larger now that I had that rib stress fracture. So maybe my little lightweight frame didn't like the extra extra power handed to it but uh, who knows yeah. your legs outgrew your ribs yeah exactly now it's time to make your ribs outgrow your legs <laughs> <laughs> jacob's mentioned it a few times as he's probably the the leanest dude and we could all lose a couple couple kilos he doesn't have to pull us down the course anymore i certainly have kind of an optimal weight in mind for racing in tokyo and have been there for other races i think i i gained a few when we were sitting in quarantine and gav's mom delivered cinnamon buns to our hotel on his birthday so just boxes of them laying around stuck in a hotel it's not a good recipe so your mom was dropping off cinnamon buns gavin yeah she wasn't worried about us losing a kilo or two <laughs> <laughs> A huge thank you to our title sponsor, Nicola Wealth, the gold standard of investment advice for affluent families, foundations, and institutions across North America. Nicola Wealth is also the premier partner of the Can Fund 150 Women, where women support female athletes and each other to achieve excellence. Nicola Wealth also has their own podcast, The Wealth Exchange. This show is full of great interviews and inspires you to achieve your aspirations beyond wealth. Providing access to experts, topics explore, leadership impact, wealth planning, and investing, philanthropy, and building better businesses. Listen to The Wealth Exchange with a quick search for Nicola Wealth on your favorite podcast listening app. So let's talk about Lucerne because you, your crew came off Lucerne. You had an incredible race there. The crew qualified for Tokyo in Lucerne. Tell me about the heat. You're near going down the, the course at 40 strokes a minute, and the Austrians were there, the Croatians were there. Tell me about that race, Gavin. Going into the race, we were all had those nerves that you get when something's super important. But I know for myself, it was just a lot of faith in the program and the work that we'd all put in and knowing Terry thought we were fast enough and just trusting that because the last race we'd done was like, I guess 2019 Worlds was the last like proper big race other than NRCs or inter team racing. So it had been a while. But as soon as we started, we actually had a bad start in the heat. We kind of got pulled over to port and hit a buoy or two. But I think we all just kind of stayed internal there and did our start from that point, knowing how we want to move the boat. And then like 250 meters in just had the feeling that we were in our rhythm, doing our race plan, how we wanted. And then I could feel that we were just faster than the other boats. And so it was like such an exciting feeling to know we we're starting to pull away. And then going through the K we started to, uh, all relax a little bit more and get a bit longer and row with a bit less tension. And it was just a really nice way to get back onto the racing scene. Yeah, that sounds enjoyable. Well, it's <laughs> after the second <laughs> kilometer of the race. Yeah. It must have been some, some mild terror at the start. Why'd the boat go off course? I think it was a bit of excitement just at the first chance at racing for all of us for years <laughs> the last big race that we had was quite a while ago and so there's a lot of good energy in the boat some nervous energy which is good to have as well and i mean we were in the buoys far faster than i could have steered us there <laughs> but luckily i was able to steer us out so from my perspective i just had to divert a little bit of mental energy and maybe a bit of physical energy cranking my toe back over to starboard and get us back in the middle of the lane and as soon as we were there i was supposed to keep our heads in the boat but i definitely did a little bit of a check to see how much work we had to do to make up for that slight error but we were right next to the austrians and i was expecting to look over and see the croatians based off of some of the other races we'd had and seeing the croatians back and the austrians we were just neck and neck with them after that and i 
then started to feel pretty good about how the race was going to unfold. But kind of just after I knew that, I just kept my head in and I'm pretty sure everybody else did. And we just executed the rest of the plan after a little bit of a mishap. But yeah, nothing, nothing too serious. Well, and then you learn from it. You learned the semifinal. You went out and you were smoking off the start in the semifinal. Tell me about that, Jacob. That was our first. Yes, yeah, so we were up with the against the French. There it was a boat that we knew had done really well at the World Cup earlier, not not too long ago. So we knew they were going to be fast, and kind of the same thing happened as as in the heat, where we had a well much better start, but just we executed the race plan very well. It's it's a very simple race plan, but we all know it by heart and expect to hear certain calls and and know what the moves are going to be. And everyone committed to those things. And we ended up being able to get up and and win pretty, pretty comfortably. I'd say there was definitely no big panicky moments or anything like that. It was, it was like, well, in our control to to win it, but then still conserve the necessary energy needed to, to race the final. That was going to be two hours later. Tell me what the rhythm feels like in the four when it's going well. When, when it's going well, it, it feels light. And the rate, even though we raced at such a high rate, I think our average was 41 or 42 for a lot of a lot of our races there. It doesn't feel that high at all. You pile a bunch of adrenaline and caffeine into the situation. It feels like you can really click click it along in that at that rate for quite some time and yeah we're really we focus on trying to keep that front end moving quickly and using our legs as much as we can to to keep it that way and keep keep the speed up keep the boat lifted keep the speed up and making sure we're moving out of bow together and again kind of give that boat some energy some life as it surges out and then buying that time on the recovery letting the boat shoot through the water like an arrow before we repeat the process again so what are some of the calls that you'll use internally on the boat to because are you making the calls jacob or is luke making the calls yeah i was making the calls so you're talking about swinging out of the bow or wanting a, a quick a quick entry to pick it up together yeah or to make the glide better i'm just curious about the language you're using to achieve that end right it's it's a big focus on keeping the upper body loose, so calling for a lot of loose shoulders and and keeping it leg driven, using the big powerful muscles to keep ourselves efficient. So it's a lot of calls to kind of remind ourselves of that, and then also just making sure we're patient with it at the front end and not falling victim to trying to work super hard too early with the. Because at the catch, if you do that, that's kind of when the upper body gets introduced too quickly. If you're just immediately searching for resistance on the blade, then you end up pulling a lot instead of pushing. And that's just wasted energy. So that's something that we've definitely been working a lot on since this project was put together, I'd say. So pushing through the catch versus pulling through the catch. You got to give them the duck legs call. Jacob. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so Terry a few times would say it's like it's like a duck rowing should look kind of like a duck swimming through the water where it look it's just still on the body. You don't see the legs pumping underneath the water. So that's kind of a call we have is duck legs. And then to keep make sure we're keeping the traction on the blade through the water and not washing out, we think about keeping dark puddles. So we kind of combine those two elements and say dark ducks. I love it. So duck legs, calm on the top, aggressive underneath. Dark puddles are obviously good because that means that you're actually locked on with your blade. You've manipulated the water properly with the blade. If it's too, if there's too much white, that means that there's wash, there's air coming in, there's ripping. You're not locked on properly into the, into the water. So I, yeah, I like that, dark puddles. Tell me about Luke. It's your turn. The final in in Lucerne. You're putting down dark puddles. Uh, you're racing against the South Africans. 
And I've actually been become a fan of the South Africans partially because of their podcast and how much they're actually contributing to the the culture of world rowing. And so I've been hearing a lot of their commentary, which has been enjoyable to listen to, but I still would have liked to have seen you guys beat them. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> so, so tell me about the race and, and how it went down for you. The final was exciting and nervous all at the same time. It was a really good feeling going into that the starts kind of looking around the other crews before we started racing and knowing that like we have beaten those crews already if it wasn't that day it was the day before and like that we could do it we did it before pretty comfortably and that it wasn't going to be an issue and it was really just south africans on our mind for the crew that was the unknown and they'd won all their races as well so we knew that they were going to be the big boat to kind of tango with down the course like all the other races we got into our rhythm right away really tried to push it hard at the start and we got out and then they just had a bit of a better middle climber than us we tried back at the finish i think having the back-to-back races proved to be a little tough for us but we were definitely excited to have the opportunity to race twice we've been doing a lot of racing here where we've had to have tight turnarounds and so that was kind of a nice little bit of a win in our sails being like oh okay like we've done this before we've had to buy carb twice in a day sort of thing like this is doable for us we're not nervous or scared of the situation so that was kind of fun and i remember when we crossed the line part of me was like oh, like damn we didn't win like that's really too bad and then like sit i felt like i was sitting there for like a few minutes being like just kind of like heartbroken and then and then realizing that like holy cow like we still qualified like we've done all this work the boat's still going to the olympics and then it was like the celebration but then <laughs> Looking back, watching the video, I realized that we just celebrated like instantly right away. <laughs> but it, it felt like forever, like just that feeling of like, oh, we didn't, like we didn't win. And just, I think that hunger to want to win all the time, I think that the South Africans are definitely beatable for us. Yeah. Oh, that's good news. Well, that's good news. And the four is, an, is a great field. It's, it's, oh, very, it's very competitive is there's a lot of a lot of great boats, great athletes, countries who can't quite field an eight and are working to build up their eight will put athletes in the four. And then some countries simply just focus on the four. And like Great Britain, I think, has held the four title at the Olympics for I don't know how many too Olympics long in a row. Way too long. <laughs> Operation. That's right. <laughs> Hope to change that in a few months there. Yeah. <laughs> Before we talk, I'd like to go forward to Tokyo and talk about Tokyo, but I, you've mentioned Terry a few times in this conversation, so I want to open the kimono on Terry Paul. Tell me how Terry compares to past coaches, especially, say, Martin McElroy. Terry's definitely a superb coach. Also probably the best coach I've ever had. He has a very clear vision as to how he thinks the boat should be moving and he has an incredible eye for for being able to identify if it's going the way he wants it to or not and and then actually verbally conveying what he wants it to look like or feel like and that's that's where he has all these funny and useful metaphors that that sometimes (laughs) <laughs> like he'll just say something while we're rowing then it's just such a funny metaphor that i just kind of start i can't help but giggle a bit to myself as we're rowing along but tell me about a couple and then i'm gonna have Luke come in <laughs> yeah so like when he likes to say when to, to get that swing out of bow he likes to describe that feeling of being on the front wheels of your seat he likes to just tell you to like hang your groceries over the edge of the seat yeah he likes to like loose fingers on the oar he likes to describe those loose fingers as saturday night fingers and not have too much harsh grip on the on the oar yeah i mean there, there's a lot of them but, and that they really <laughs> resonate with the boys and and get the message conveyed and still you know, get a good keep things lighthearted and get a good laugh out of it that's great. What about you, Luke? What's What do you notice from Terry, what he's saying? Definitely think that Terry is also one of the best coaches I've had. I've had the privilege of him being my coach under 23s as well. So I've had a couple times to be coached by Terry. But yeah, he's got some pretty funny things he says. One of the ones that, actually, that really work well for us is a little bit of gin and tonic when we're rowing. 
because if you have talking about power and also finesse because if you have too much gin in a gin and tonic like too much power it's not going to be it's not going to be as good and if you have too much tonic whereas you're just thinking about the finesse and not driving it it's not really going to go uh, as well or as fast as you want it to so you have to have that right balance of gin and tonic to make the perfect drink so just little funny things like that he's just really is able to help keep it light but also keep it serious because now when he's talking about gin and tonic it's not you don't quite get the same laugh now because what he's trying to say what he's saying but it still has that lightness of like he's not mad or he's not upset but he's serious and just trying to make it uh relatable to the guys and i think he does a really good job at at doing that for sure i think he's a great coach and what's the training program like is terry designing the training program for your boat yeah he's doing the training program for us so right now we're doing a little bit of intensity kind of ramping up obviously to leave for tokyo we're in a bit of a bit of a grinding it out block which is a lot of fun kind of really pushing those limits doing a lot of pace stuff which is always fun really priming those engines to get going uh, in a little bit here which is exciting give me an example of some of the workouts that you do that are classic terry paul workouts classic terry paul workouts terry paul loves his his pyramids his p24s and p26s in the pairs, just banging it out as hard as you can at those rates. And that's really driving that, that whole power application and just trying to hammer it as hard as you can at a 24 and a 26 and just trying to get that bow across the line first as hard as you can. So that one really drives the boys into the ground in the middle of the week, which is always fun. And um, so you'll break, you'll break the four into pairs and then yeah. a pyramid 26, you'll do three yeah. minutes at 22, 22. two minutes at 24, one minute at 26, and then two minutes, 24, three minutes, 22. The last little bit, it's been me and Gav against Will and Jacob. So it's been pretty fun doing stuff like that with the guys. It's always fun to have a little bit of competition because like the guys have said, we have a pretty small program with just the five of us right now, or just the six of us. So who's the sixth man who's not on the call? Cody Bailey was doing a lot of work with us. He was in the four as well for a long time for a while and he also had a bit of a rib issue which is uh why i'm now in the boat which is too bad because he really brought a lot to the crew and really brought a lot to our our group environment so we're just having the six of us it was tough to really get a lot of good side-by-side action so it was nice to break down into pairs and have two or three pairs kind of going at it together uh and really try to bang it out and trying to be that first boat across the line. It's just different doing it in the four when you're doing it against no one versus in the pair when you're doing it against someone else. You kind of find that extra gear that you didn't quite think you had when Will and Jake are moving away and Gav starts screaming behind me that I have to go. Okay, yeah, we got to go. So it's it's fun. It's fun. I know during some of the time trial pieces, you'll line up against the women's eight and some of the yeah. other crews and you'll have uh, launch according to, to gold standard time. But I haven't looked at gold standard times in a while. How close is the women's eight time to the men's four time? I think it's about eight seconds over 2K or nine seconds over 2K. Is that right, guys? I'm not 100% sure. I think that's right. Something like that. Probably like three splits faster, maybe. The eight or nine seconds is to catch them by the 1500. Get that little taste of being behind, taste of being right next to them, and then taste of being ahead and likewise for them. 13 seconds, I think, is the difference in world records. How often are you training with, with the women's eight? Well, we try to do a handful of sessions every week with them. Like We'll go up and do some long-distance stuff up island twice a week up at Seanigan. And we often do that workout with the women's eight, just two, two laps up at Seanigan. It's about 28K side-by-side side with the women's eight, which is a lot of fun. We have a small group, so it's nice when we are able to open it up to having more people. It makes it more competitive, which makes it more fun. And tell me about the different places that you're training right now. Because I know on uh, Vancouver Island, you're training on Elk Lake, Shawnigan Lake, and up in Duncan. So tell me the difference between those three lakes and how you're moving between them. Yeah, so, I mean, Elk Lake is home. So that's where we do the big bulk of our training. And everyone lives in, in the Victoria area. So we're mostly mostly here. And then twice a week, we've been going up to Shawnigan just to get some longer stretches and not as much turning or not, not as much stopping and turning. So we're able to really kind of get into that aerobic zone without having to stop and 
rearrange our course, which is nice. And then every six weeks or so, we go up and we do a little race series up in in Duncan because they have the buoys up there. So it gives everyone a little bit of a taste of racing on an actual course. And the water's usually put up there for racing, nice and flat in the mornings. So it's a really good spot to really kind of drill that race plan and make it feel like second nature. So yeah, those are the three places we really train a lot of is here, Shawnigan and Duncan. They all have their strengths for us and they all definitely have their drawbacks. Like wind is a big one, but <laughs> but no, it's good for sure. Yeah, which where do you get the biggest wind? Uh the biggest wind's probably at Elk Lake coming off the highway. That's always a fun one. I think I think everywhere we get hit with a lot of wind every once in a while, everywhere. So tell me about the wind. How does that uh, affect the boat? Definitely kind of numbs out some boat feel. You're preoccupied with trying to battle whatever kind of offset that the wind is giving you. And if obviously if it's a headwind or a crosswind, then the boat's going to feel much heavier and it's more difficult to groove in the rhythm that you've put so much attention to on the flat days but it's always it's important to focus on the same thing we always focus on which is utilizing the big muscles in in a heavy wind like that um, otherwise you're just going to die out and post a bad bad prognostic so what are some of the calls you'd make when the you get hit by a crosshead the boat starts feeling heavy the the rhythm starts to fall apart what calls tend tend to work in the boat? Definitely want to bring everyone's attention to to looseness again, and try to not fight the wind. Try and make these micro adjustments on on the recovery, but not be doing anything drastic, like leaning super hard one way or the other. And then another one would just be to uh, make sure you're finishing off each stroke. Sometimes. When the boat speed is lower, but you want to be continuing with the high power output, then you start washing out and not actually bringing that boat with you. So it's really important to remember to finish off each stroke and stay true to to, to the rhythm as closely as you can. I know finishes were a big a big focus of Spracklin, so I'm going to use this as a good segue to come back to you, Will. And I want you to talk about how the technical focuses of Sprackland changed through the years with Martin McElroy and have since evolved with, with Terry Paul and, and the difference between those three coaches. To touch on what you're asking about with Terry, my relationship with him goes back quite a ways, which is awesome. I can remember when my coach, John Armitage, first introduced me to Terry Paul back in the really early 2000s when we were just a bunch of young kids in high school and Terry was doing his development squad stuff and he was kind of in charge of the under 23 program and junior program and so he swung through Kingston and put us through the paces of making sure we were swung over to position three which is where your legs are still down but your hands and body are swung over and that was very much the kind of Spracklin way but yeah no, he John Armitage was a, another great coach you know, I'll give a little shout out because he was one of those guys who's just given everything to the club all of his spare time and is one of those people that allows young Canadian athletes such as ourselves and yourself to get to where we are early on where they're just giving up all their time for the future generations. So to get back to your question about the difference in coaching styles, I mean, getting coached by Mike early on was amazing for me and something I dreamed of as a kid in high school and so to finally be coached by him and row this current rhythm that we're rowing which is very much like a Canadian rhythm and it was very well known of holding the finishes and swinging over to position three quickly and floating forwards and being poised to take that catch and do it all over again was then reversed to what a lot of people were doing in different countries because Martin McElroy came in to take over for Mike Spracklin and he started coaching us to have this time at the back and poise at the finish and so there was like a moment at uh, the finish of the stroke where you've just taken your blade out before you swing over and then travel back up to the slide back up the slide to the catch 
So that led to a lot of confusion for a lot of the guys who had been rowing one way for a decade and became the source of a lot of frustration at times to uh, make that change. So yeah, we had Martin come in and, you know, he was dealt sometimes I think maybe an impossible task to try to break an eight and a half and get two medals out of it because it's not quite so easy as we found out. And on top of that, trying to change a lot of the technical stuff that was grooved in over years and years of Canadians watching men's eight rowing and doing it one way for so long to try to shift that tide to a different way of doing things. And I think we did a wicked job with it, but obviously it wasn't quite enough. So what did you notice the difference between the style? Because it's a poising at the finish versus poising at the catch, which essentially the poise is that, you know, that general breath where you feel the boat truly run away on you. Yeah. Well, I think with like the, the influx in the use of technology and training and having pieces of technology that measure the boat acceleration, it was shown that a pause at the finish allows the boat to run down maybe a little bit differently than if you're swinging forward and then moving quickly into the catch and attempting to move quickly out and kind of travel quickly through that point where the boat is moving its slowest at the catch and all that weight of all those guys coming into the catch has to be reversed. Trying to change directions quickly through the front end can be seen, I guess, as more efficient if you have eight guys doing the same thing versus eight guys doing a bunch of different things that they all think is correct, but it's all different. Like it's going to be a much slower boat than just eight people doing the same thing. So that for us has been a pretty big, I guess, adaption, adaptation back from training under Martin McElroy and then Dick Tonks as well, who came in to take over the sweep program. So What's, we've... Where does Dick like to poise? I think, I mean, he's a man of few words, so I don't know if he's ever said poise or anything like that, but it seemed as though our technical model was poising at the finish as well. And so people were trying to adapt that style as well. And then once we went under the tutelage of Terry Paul again, we moved back to the swing rhythm, which is kind of very much that Canadian rhythm, which I was happy about because that's really what's hardwired into my cells, I guess. And so, yeah, we're, now we're back to that swing over to position three and then floating up to the catch and stinging it through. Well, what do you think about that rhythm, Gavin? The poising over the toes, getting getting quick around the turn, and then setting up for the help. Yeah, I like it quite a bit. I think my first real time training in a sweet boat was under Terry going to under 23. So that's kind of how I learned the rhythm while sweeping. And so it feels quite natural. And when all four of us are just doing the same thing together, it feels really easy to just swing to three and have everything ready for the catch and there's no last minute movements with the body or shoulders. You can just float up to the top and let your blade fill up at the catch and your legs are moving. I've often heard it said, you know, if you want to win, you got to buy in. And it, it doesn't truly matter the rhythm per se that you're rowing as long as everybody's rowing it together. And I even noticed this, you know, even within different boats, people will will take their glide and let the boat run at different points at at the catch at the finish, and some even you know, more in sort of the middle of the recovery. And boats go fast all sorts of ways, so it's just trying to figure out what's what's working best for that. And I'm going to come back to you, Will, because you've you've been through the alternations of style. Like, do you think Canada should have a style? that is more mandated and doesn't change with the coaches and the coaches should adapt to a Canadian style or coaches should have the style that they advocate for? What do you think would be better for the long-term health of, of a national program? Just as we were thrust into a situation where a different technique was not forced upon us, but that was the way we were being coached. I don't think a coach should be pushed to do something that they don't necessarily believe in either. Or I just think it'll be really hard to get the most out of an athlete or a coach if you're trying to make like a 
round peg fit into a square hole kind of situation. So I, I think as you touched on, just the biggest thing is belief in what everybody's doing and having everybody pointed north and headed that direction is probably more important. So I guess I'd be hard pressed to want to have a coach that you know didn't believe in a certain way of doing things and then having them forced to make a change that they maybe had second thoughts about just as you wouldn't want to do that to an athlete who's heading into the biggest race of their lives you just don't want to have any cracks in the in the wall well why not put put pressure on the high performance directors for because that's their job to find a coach that fits within within the purview of 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 Canadian rowing and Canadian athletes there's a lot of people that have opinions that come into play as to what style is promoted and encouraged. Certainly, I would expect that those uh, people in the high performance head offices of Rowing Canada are hopefully feeling, you know, the pressure to continue the legacy of Rowing Canada by making those correct decisions. And I think that we do things like coaches conferences and different outreach programs to try and spread the good word of the Canadian rhythm across Canada. I like to think that they're trying as best as they can. I don't necessarily see that a lot from my seat, not that it's not happening, but just I'm focused on the day-to-day on Elk Lake and Shawnigan Lake. And so I would imagine that there's that trickle down from high performance down to the next novices that are going to be the next Luke Gadsons and Jacob Bucheks and Mr. Stones, like just as I felt that when I was in high school, everybody knew how to row the Canadian rhythm when Spracklin was at the helm and he was getting you guys to send the finish and swing to position three. It was well known at that point. So I, I hope that we can get back to a point where that's the case because, I mean, right now on our sweep team, there are two different rhythms being rowed between the men's pair under Dick Tonks and our heavyweight sweep program, and as well as the heavyweight women's double and the heavyweight women. It's a little bit open to interpretation, but I'm sure it would be beneficial to have everybody on the same page, no doubt. Let's look forward to Tokyo, and I want to start with, with Luke. So Luke, tell me, what are, you, what are you picturing about the racing in Tokyo? We've been told it's going to be kind of like a tail cross conditions, just kind of based on where the course is situated. So that's going to be fun. I think it'll be good for us because we do a lot of rowing in some rougher water. So I think that we're going to be in a good spot to be able to handle those conditions well. And especially staying loose in the upper body is one thing we've been working on a lot. I think it's going to go very smoothly. As for the racing itself, it's going to be very exciting because they mean that every World Cup, the last little bit, even in like the Europeans and stuff, the top three have been changing just about every time, the order and the different crews that are in there. So, I mean, I think it's pretty open for anyone to really go out and get it. So I think it's going to be some pretty hard racing. I think it's going to be some pretty exciting racing. It's going to be fun to race against the best of the best that you guys have been watching since 2019, see how they're developing. So we're developing against the times that we have given to us from these events. But I'm yeah, I think it's going to be wicked hard to deal with these conditions i think it's going to be come down to the crews that are able to stay calm and stay internal which is something i think we do a really good job with i'm going to talk through each of the crews you've got poland romania great britain italy usa australia netherlands switzerland south africa and in canada who are you expecting to be in the finals Ah. Uh, I think it's really tough to kind of pin down which top boat will be in the finals. Obviously, Canada will be in the final for sure. No doubt about that. But I think it's going to be, you're going to see the Brits for sure up there, I think, because they've been one of those crews that have been in the top three just about every regatta so far. I think like the Australians are normally really fast. The Roman, Those young Romanians are quick. I mean, everyone's fast. It's really tough to lock down and make a, make a comment on how, on what it's going to look like. I just... I think it could be open to absolutely anyone and everyone. I think everyone's really going to be gunning for it, for sure. Do you have any rivalries? Definitely the South Africans are going to be one that it's going to be really nice to beat. Just because at like, the last chance qualifier, they just nicked us by like a second and a half. So it's uh, it'll be really nice to 
to really take it to them again and have a nice little little battle with them again. So that, that's one I'm really looking forward to to racing against for sure. Yeah. How about you, Jacob? I'd say I really want to dethrone the GB, the Brits. I think. Like, I mean, they've won this event at Olympics of what four or five Olympics in a row now. So I think that's going to be a fun one to chase and nick away from them. Yeah, Great Britain has been certainly a powerhouse in the men's four. And Canada even has a history all the way back to Athens with that great crew with Barney Williams, Jake Wetzel, Cam Berg, and Tom Hirschmiller just being edged out at the end by the British. The only crew we loved beating more than the British were the Americans, actually, when I <laughs> when we were racing, but we always loved we always love beating GB for some reason. <laughs> we, I love the guys. I, and it's funny, even after the fact, I'm still, I text a lot with some of the Americans and, and British to this day, which is surprising in 13 years after the fact. But it's, it's nice to have that competition, that collegial competition. What about you, Gavin? What are you looking forward to most in the Olympic regatta? The Olympics has been something I've, had my eyes set on for a while so i'm incredibly excited to get to go and compete at the at the biggest moment and certainly although the brits do seem like they've been pretty dominant so far this season it would feel amazing to beat them and that's definitely the thought in my mind is just the next month and a bit that we've got just get as fast as we can and go for gold which is really exciting to get to do let's talk about life after tokyo and we're, i'm going to go through through each of you and i'm and i'll start with josh what's life look like for you as the spare you'll be on the side if there's any injuries you'll be coming in and out post tokyo are you heading to paris and what else for you oh uh, yeah the plan is definitely to try and get ready for paris this year is a little weird because they're having the regular world championships held in Shanghai in October. And there's already a group of guys, just a small group of guys training in Duncan already. So when I get back and finish my quarantine, kind of be pretty hungry to get training with them and start getting ready for the world champs at the end of October. Okay. Is there a boat slated for world champs in Shanghai? I don't think there's any boats yet that they have their eyes on. Terry, Terry's trying, trying to hype everyone up about an eight going, but I don't know if there's enough bodies for that right now. Often on an Olympic year, you have something called non-Olympic worlds where they have the non-Olympic boats that compete as well. But this is a full slate in October. Yeah, yeah, full full world championships in October. Is this the first year that they've done that? I believe so because of COVID, just with the Olympics being in 2021. Uh, I think they still wanted the full world championships this year. Do you get a good sense about how athletes around the world are responding to that, having a world championships just a few months after the Olympics? I honestly have no, no clue. I feel like... A lot of athletes or crews might depend on how they do at the Olympics. I feel like if some crews win, then maybe they'll be motivated to try and win at world champs as well. and Or maybe they'll hang up the oars after winning and said that they've done enough. And I feel like the same could go if people underperform. Maybe they'll get discouraged from trying to do world champs or they'll be extra motivated to get the start of the next quadrennial off on the right foot. And then career post rowing. I don't think we talked about that. Do you have any of that in mind? I'm not really too, too sure. I went to Trent University and got a computer science degree. So maybe something in that field, but I haven't put a ton of thought spending however many hours outside every day. I think it could be a pretty hard change to spending too many hours inside so i'll definitely have to think about that i've worked with a few uh, rowers in transition or who have transitioned and they've (laughs) entered the computer science field and they really didn't like it simply because they're working in a basement 
And yeah, okay, well, I'll cross that off my list then. Well, the, <laughs> the, I, you know, maybe something peripherally re- <laughs> related, like wind turbine technician, where you actually have to like climb up a wind turbine and do some coding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could be fun for sure. Yeah. And then, Will, how about you? Tokyo 2020, you've had quite a run. Is this your final Olympics or are you, or no, or are you going to keep doing this as long as you can? What's, what's your thoughts? Never say never for sure. I think the emotions of the games really shape your decision and more about how you're feeling and your results obviously plays a, an impact as well. So I'm not saying I'm going to hang it up after this by any means, but Certainly looking forward to decompressing afterwards as it's been a long two years. We've kind of gone all in with our chips and then COVID came around and we had to go all in again. No, I mean, I had my first retirement after Rio after 2017 and I went and skied up in Whistler and tried to, you know, develop a new skill and had a lot of fun with that. But then there was a lot of lonely chair lift rides to the top of the mountain where I was thinking about rowing and it started to sound like some awesome stuff was starting to happen back at the center. So I kind of had a little bit of a spirit quest to see what I needed to do with my life and decided to come back to rowing and make a push for Tokyo. Tell me about the spirit quest because there must have been an epiphanal (laughs) moment where you came to a realization. Well, I went for a walk in the woods up in Whistler, the sun was kind of like starting to come out and spring skiing was all but over. And I was actually gearing up to go do my firefighter uh, training down in Texas, which I ended up doing. But I went and tried to get lost in the woods a little bit and found a nice rock with a river flowing around it and stood there thinking about my future and what I was feeling. And I realized how kind of stressed out I felt about my current situation and the decision that I was trying to make and kind of a switch flipped within me after pondering for a little while where I made up my mind that I wanted to come back to rowing and then immediately a plan started formulating in my head about how I wanted to go about it. I wasn't sleeping well, I wasn't you know, eating well and then as soon as I made the decision to come back to rowing I just Everything fell into place for me. My stomach wasn't bothering me after meals anymore. And I just was sleeping well. And I just all of a sudden had this, you know, plan in front of me. And it really felt like the right decision. I've had uh, an amazing career leading up to that decision. And the stuff that I've learned from the guys that I'm running with now is equal to all the people that I've rode with before, learning lessons, learning how to interact with new people, learning how to get the best performance out of myself and my teammates. Yeah, it's been an amazing journey. So, you know, I'd be a crazy person to say I'd forgo doing that again right now without knowing how I feel afterwards. You still toy with the idea of firefighting. I think that that'd be an amazing job. I think it'd be an amazing way to give back to a community that's given me so much. I think there are a lot of parallels within the two worlds, rowing and firefighting. You're on a team, you're with highly motivated people, periods of downtime, periods of intensity, seemingly a great work-life balance. Obviously, I'm speaking from you know what I've heard. I haven't actually worked on the job or anything, but it seems like something that I would really enjoy. And yeah, a great career path that's really rewarding. Yeah, well, any fire chiefs listening to this, you've got a man, Will Crothers. <laughs> Let's move down the boat to Gavin. Gavin, post-Tokyo, what are your thoughts? Uh, so I still have one year of school left. So in the fall, I'm going to head back to Queen's University to finish my degree. And What's your degree in? A chemical engineering. And then, as long as I'm still enjoying everything, but I'm fairly certain I'm going to head back out to Victoria or Duncan and pursue the road to Paris. Yeah. Yeah, it's a road for Paris. And then do you think, why chemical engineering? Do you think that you'll move into mining, petroleum, pharmaceuticals? What's the, what's the thought? 
Yeah, back in high school, I just always had a lot of fun working with math and science. And so engineering seems like a good way to use those in a problem solving sense, which is always fun to get to use tools to solve problems. And I think I want to go into kind of wastewater management side of chemical engineering, but I don't have any work experience yet. So I need to kind of feel that out as I, as I get a little bit closer to it, but yeah. Yeah. And that sounds like a good path and you're spending a lot of time in the water. So you've, you have an, an intense relationship with it at the moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah good, good appreciation. of <laughs> Luke, what's after Tokyo for you? Uh, so post Tokyo for me, I'm going to come back to Victoria and head up to Duncan with Joshi and try to make a push for this world's team in October as well. And or have you been studying anything in school? Yeah, I was at Brock for a few years. I was doing a recreation and leisure studies there, which was fun. It was good. Uh, I'm not really sure if that was the path I want to take. I mostly chose the university route for rowing, which in hindsight, maybe wasn't the best call. I mean, I had some really good coaches, really good crewmates that helped me get to this point. Peter Summerwell was my coach there and shouts out to him. I'm 100% sure if that's the path I want to take. I know I really wanted to get into the trades in high school and stuff. So I think I was, I would really like to go and pick up my trade for electrical and do that for a few years and ultimately make the same path as well and become a firefighter. It's something I've always wanted to do as well. Okay. Get into the electrical trades, do get into firefighting. Yeah. Get into a career that's more haptic, hands-on. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay. That's great. And then Jacob, bring us home. Bowman. What's post Tokyo? I'm not planning on doing another quad as rewarding and amazing as the whole journey has been. It's also just, as everyone knows, it's so many sacrifices must be made to lead this life and kind of keen on trying to develop my career maybe a bit and yeah, just try something else for a little while. And, but I, again, I'm like, will like never say never, who knows I might go and be working and just hate my life and <laughs> want to get back to get, to, to rowing boats and being outside and having that intense common common goal shared with a group of intense dudes. So I'm never going to say never either, but for now I'm planning on taking some time off after Tokyo and traveling a bit and then, then seeing what else is out there. Will you go back into the st- sustainable development space? Yeah, that's what I'm planning on, yep. Yeah. Are you going to go back to America to do that, or would you do that in Canada? What's your thought? Uh, yeah, the company I I work part time for is based in the U.S. outside of Boston, so I'm hoping to be able to continue with them for a while and yeah, see what kind of opportunities show up. So have have you been keeping up some work with them while you're training? Yeah, yeah. Luckily, they've been super accommodating for me and letting me help them out a bit uh, and and my and they've been working around my crazy training schedule so been able to work a bit definitely not when we are traveling and racing but when we're here training in victoria I'd, yeah find some time yeah and so what kind of workload that's his interest so what kind of workload do you maintain while you're training i'd say on average it would be like an hour or two a day so super super low (laughs) yeah and so what what type of projects are you working on and how are you able to contribute to to an office and to a to a working team with that kind of schedule i guess for better for worse with covid everyone from the office is now working remotely of course so in that regard it's kind of a level playing field and everyone's schedules have also been you know shifted around although everyone's more reliably working consistent times but it's a consulting firm that works largely for as a government contractor so doing projects for the epa and the dol fda and i just do really basic analytical work even though i've been working there now technically technically since 2016 
since I don't work much, I haven't really progressed in terms of promotions. But yeah, I just do basically the stuff that a lot of other people don't want to do, which is literature reviews, data cleaning, stuff that's that's really easy to do with a flexible schedule, not something that a client is in desperate need of with a quick turnaround. So it's worked out. That's interesting. It's, it's, and it's almost nice to have something on the corner of your desk, too, to kind of escape the the mental slog of training that you can yeah. go into. That's so definitely. big props to the ERG group for supporting you on your oh, yeah, journey. Big, big props to them, yeah. So, gentlemen, you know, Jacob, Will, Joshua, Gavin, Luke, it was wonderful to chat with each of you. And I wish you... All the best on the rest of your training and certainly competition Tokyo 2020. Thanks a lot, Adam. Yeah, it was an awesome time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Adam. Thank you very much for this. It's been fun. What a great conversation. Interesting to hear Abu Chek caps up his career with the ERG group, very aptly named Luke Gadsen, hailing from Leander, going to get into the electrical trades and Gavin Stone coming from Island Lake, working with Phil Marshall as a coach. Great to hear from him too. Loved hearing about Will Crothers' spirit journey after Rio, bringing him back on the side of a mountain. I've had similar experiences myself where sometimes you don't really know the direction to take. And sometimes that time in mother nature really makes it clear this is the next step that needs to be taken so all the best and not to forget josh king the computer scientist all the best to these gentlemen as they continue their preparations and compete with the world in tokyo 2020 executives business owners this is for you This is for you because you might experience career anxiety or overwhelm that leaves you feeling like you may have a heart attack. Or maybe you have increasing thoughts where you're questioning your career path and maybe you need a new one. When I'm not recording podcasts, I'm using my best radio DJ voice to help high-performing business leaders across North America align their work with who they are so they can achieve unprecedented career success without anxiety, without frustration, and wanting to quit their job. You'll discover, clarify, and implement personal and career strategies that move in parallel and increase your earnings, accomplishments, and quite frankly, life enjoyment. Don't quit, fail, or worse, waste years of struggling to achieve your professional ambitions because you're experiencing the inevitable rough waters of business and professional life. Get more information at my website, creekspeak.com. That's with a K, K K-R-E-E-K-S-P-E-A-K.com to learn if executive coaching with me is a good fit for you. Thank you for listening to Roro Tokyo. Again, I'm your host, Adam Creek. Feel free to reach out to me with comments on Twitter at Adam Creek. That's at sign A D A M K R E E K. No, it's not like the river or the squeaky door. It's a creek with a K. A huge thank you to our title sponsor of this podcast, Nicola Wealth the gold standard of investment advice for affluent families, foundations, and institutions across North America. And another thank you to Whitehall Rowing and Sail and the Oarboard, which is the transportable, collapsible rower that you can take anywhere. Thank you, Rowing Canada, for your support to wrangle these athletes. And thank you, CBC, for promoting these conversations on your massive platform. This show is produced by the wonderful Mary Chan of Organized Sound Productions. The sound is edited and mixed by the creative Danelle Cloutier.